okay so rose happened actually quite naturally and very seamlessly um so we have a company called the ajc africa um that is pretty much like a full level services touring support bookings a and and all of that stuff um so we have partnerships with a bunch of other like companies across the world and heavy rotation llc is one of them um heavy rotation happens to be a booking um agency responsible for a bunch of global acts around the world um, from recross to tour lanes to trace songs a bunch of guys so they reached out saying hey guys we're looking to bring recross to africa do you have any potential clients or buyers or whatever and obviously we shared it within our network and very quickly one of the biggest clubs in abuja um also from Brussels, jumped on it apparently they i tried to get across the year before but with some plug that didn't come through so they just needed a legit plug so everything just kind of like happened naturally the timing the client was there waiting for the artists that we didn't even know so immediately they said they had recourse and we pitched them they were like them we've been looking for a cross so that happened so very naturally and easily but yeah it was quick very very quick <laughs> So we did we did three stops. We did Lagos, we did Angola, and then Abuja was the last stop. Yeah, it was definitely a good event. Um, it was our first proper activation in Abuja, so that was also very um, interesting for us. Uh, we've been going into the Abuja market trying to see what we've been doing or what we can do over a period of time, um, but. I've been very careful to not go into Abuja just as a regular promoter because they already have their guys on ground, you know, so I've been entering the market for like six months, just watching and seeing what to do. And then when this request came, thing came, I was like, all right, cool, this, this feels easy. This feels like, this is what we can use to start. Let this market know that we're here and we're ready. You know, so that was our, that was our debut in Abuja touchdown. They will see more of us soon. If you're watching in Abuja, you're going to see more of us soon. Request was just that. Okay. It was just a start. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that was done by the agency. Yes, please. The agency Africa, the hustle and bustle. They were the actual buyers and the investors. We were just the middleman for the booking. So, yeah, shout out to hustle and bustle. And yeah, there's some heavy men behind it. And, you know, and yeah, Ui, Obi Kubana, Wizi Wa, a bunch of guys that came through clutch, so clutch, you know. But, yeah. It was, it was a smooth experience. And Ross himself, definitely, I mean, hands down, OG, I give it to him. He came in and did his thing like a pro. You know, normal hiccups here and there, the African way, you know, stuff that could have frustrated him. And he came in and he did his thing, hands down, you know, like nothing ever happened. So, yeah, I guess everything went well. Good vibes, good experience. And that's kind of where we're looking to go from this year more global stuff, more international stuff, more exchanges, export our talents and bring more people in, stuff like that, yeah, so. On the record, I've never done this before, so. Um, it really all started from like a really young age, you know, <clears throat> childhood, primary school days. And I would say church in itself was a very, very big factor, um, but contrary to what a lot of people just are randomly assume to say when you say church, um, for me, church was like, excuse me, church was a, some sort of an escape for me. And it was also my first actual networking hub, if that makes any sense. I mean, it wasn't networking at the time, but it was the first place to like have a bunch of different minds from different places in one place. And thankfully, everyone's intentions were kind of like guided by the environment. So everyone was like, free spirits, love, happy, you know, so there was no ill energy at that time, young age. Um, I grew up in a very personally complicated home and my dad is one of those strong, rigid guys. I didn't believe in a lot of things, a lot of things like sleepovers, you know, going to your friend's house, you know. My dad would say, why are you going to your friend's house? Why can't your friend come over to your house? And then when your friend comes over to your house, he would give them the hardest time because the father knew you're here you know so guys will just be on their own days they don't want to come to my yard i mean i can't go to their yard you know so i quickly realized that church was a safe space church was that one place that my dad would let me go without asking any questions so i, I quickly clocked i'm just like okay 
after school I get home I take off my clothes I change I'm like that I'm going to church that was my get out of jail card I'm going to church and he would ask no questions like okay so on my way to church obviously I make a couple stops stop at my guy's house TJ play FIFA then go to church my, my goal then for weekday services was get into church before it ends so that when my dad is in church looking for me about to go home I'm there so church was my way to leave the house but I wasn't really there if that makes any sense but then I had this circle of friends from church from different kinds of upbringings and lifestyles and backgrounds and I guess it was my first place of meeting having a common ground of like different personalities and eventually I started gaining this interest into like socializing parties events started really young and at the time I remember the church once again was my first point of promoting my parties because you guys were there you know the MTZ the Fresh all the kids were there and I'll think about it I mean if I take my flyers to church it's the first place I can give the set of cool kids before I even start thinking about going to school or going to Silverbird or whatever the hotspots were at the time you know and I remember being caught sharing flyers in church a couple of times you know and then I was referred to as this kid that the devil is about to use you know, coming to share party flyers inside children's church. Like, at what age, bro? What the hell is going through your mind, you know? So, I got that attention from a lot of older people that I didn't really quite understand. And it was crazy. Fast forward to, I guess we started all growing up. Life journey, school. People started traveling. And at this time, I think after secondary school, when most of my friends traveled, I kind of got into this... Um, phase where i kind of wanted to travel as well for multiple reasons one being i didn't want to be the only person left here two unfortunately the 2022 stories we hear about asu are generation long so i've been hearing these asu stories like you get into uni and you just never know when you're gonna get out just because so i was like oh more i'm not doing this nigerian university p whatever the case may be i'm gonna jump out Year one came, first batch of friends had moved. I'm still looking at Nigeria, I'm looking at school. Year two came, second batch of friends had moved. I had a look at school. Um, at the end of year three, I looked left, I looked right. I said, oh, my, this thing's not looking right. I don't think I'm buying a cup for me tomorrow morning. I wrote to the exam, passed it. I just came home and said, guys, I passed. I'm not doing the game, please. Can I get into school? I was I was home for three years. It was a very personal, personal time for me. I was, I was actually going through a lot. Um, trying to figure out what I'm trying to do next at the time fresh out of the secondary school I really wanted to be a pilot so that was my goal at the time St. John's St. John's secondary school um, I really wanted to go straight to flight school and then I applied for this Emirates scholarship I got it so I was meant to literally just go from uni straight to flight school and then my family at the time was saying this thing you need to go to uni first the live world is changing. You can't just jump into a flight school straight from secondary school, get a degree, but my brother, I lost my mind. I'm like, the hell? This thing is even a scholarship. Not like you guys are paying for it. Then I had this pilot uncle too, who went from straight to secondary school to aviation school, where I mean back in his day. And he too came out and said, listen, go to school first, get a degree. The world is changing, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, there goes all these dream killers. You know, so that took me another year. And then by the second year, they had ruined this my flight dream. So I was just like, what the hell am I going to be doing now? Trying to figure out what is the next nearest available thing to do in Nigeria that is relating to aviation so that when I do get done with it, I'm closer to what I want to do. And then try to write exams. Aviation school in Nigeria, I think it's only like one or two, maybe use area. The cut off marks were ridiculous. The price was crazy. I tried. Sure, by the end of second year, after trying to figure out a local way to stay closer to the aviation industry. I figured out or more. It wasn't quite working out right. Then I started leaning towards okay, maybe studying mechanical engineering, then go and do masters in aeronautical engineering, then go and fly. I did this Babcock exam and then got into got my admission at the end of the third year and then got into Babcock University. Studied computer science. That was the closest course I could do at the time that was anywhere close to what I really wanted to do um, not my choice but we shall narrow it down to what makes sense 
I got into computer science. I remember crazy story. School resumed September, and then you have to go through this orientation phase where they welcome you to the school, tell you the do's and don'ts, what we do, how we do the ETC. Usually that takes like another week or two before you get your room, before you get your timetable, before you settle into school like a man. I did it naturally. Do all your registration, pay your school fees, all that nonsense. So we resumed school, first set of school, September, and we settled into school through the month of September. By the first weekend in October, I threw the biggest party in school, literally the biggest. My school was outside in Lagos, and we had this big party in Lagos, and Bacchus, Bacchus, crazy, just seven used to be Bacchus. And then we had this party in Bacchus, and the school was empty, cricket empty, and school management was wondering, what the hell is going on? Like, this is a new session. I'm like, freshers are out of school, old students are out of school, graduate students are out of school. Where the hell is everybody? And then, word gets out that guys are in Lagos. There's this new set of guys that came through this party. So, on arrival, school authorities are looking for us. Who are these guys? I've never even entered school and already causing problems. So, we enter school. They came for us, they were called this, blah, 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 blah. Try to try to force us into the religious system, like try and bring all this your energy and force people to church, kind of inside school. Now, me, I grew up going to church compulsory every day. So when I got into uni and this was a daily church thing, again, I was just like, oh, what would this be like? I'm not down for it. You know, but interesting thing is what throwing the party while coming to school and i realized okay we could do this thing like child like you know create like a small social community it was fun and games originally um by the time i got into uni i realized that because i sat home for three years most of my actual natural friends were in 300 level probably 400 level but i had just got into my first year so naturally i didn't mix with a lot of my my set people my 100 level mates i didn't a lot of people thought I was arrogant. I just didn't into them. You know, so when we're doing events, we're getting a lot of attention from the 300 level, 400 level people, which was very unusual for a 100 level promoter, if that makes any sense. So the environment, the school environment was watching like all these young kids, you know, and then I had this guy at the time. This was all just random freestyle. I didn't create an organization. There was no brand name, no company, nothing. We're just train parties. You know, so I had a friend at the time, the Black Ball Bay, and we were both in uni and then Sammy. And three of us were taking this random walk and we we're just sitting down one place. And the Black Ball had this connect to the owner of Ovation Magazine. And he had been trying to engage his uncle on like what he can do for Ovation. You know, Ovation is this high level, high end, elite media platform. And we we're trying to figure out what we could do that could be for Ovation, but for the university audience. And then we try to like try to pitch the guy different ideas, and that's how Guru naturally came about. It was just sitting down on one bench, and I'm like, okay, so we want to sell this guy a social community, but for the youth, not for the billionaires. You know? mm-hmm. And we tried, we tried, we tried. I think the Alapo tried to pitch it to him. For some reason, we were young. We probably didn't even have the right information in our pitch. We just had this idea and we knew that we had somebody that could make it happen. It didn't run. So we came back and we said, okay, you know what? Let's just start building from there. You know, and we started doing these throwing parties. I think we got involved with Echo in 2009. Echo was something that was done by. Um, a couple of the, I think, Consola, Bani Wanda, is uh, a bunch of guys. It's your old Teddy crowd back then. You know, and they just hollered me and Sammy just to also bring in our Niger based university crowd and whatnot, whatnot. You know, and we did that. And then off of that, there was a lot of people from Redeemers, Babcock University, where that pulled up for Echo. I think Fabulous was the headliner of Echo that year, in 2009. Yeah. And then before we had done the fabulous edition, I can't remember what show it was, Dami Crane came up on that show. And that was actually where I discovered Dami. And 
somehow we found out that we were involved. I think Gilly logo was on the media wall. We had like a red carpet here and blah blah. So that we walked up to me. I was like, Omo, oh, we'd like to get under this Gilly Goo umbrella and let us push his P, you know. And at the time, Gilly Goo was barely just a crew, you know. So I'm like, oh, okay, access management. But I've always been this person who I kind of get bored of realms so quickly and I'm always kind of like looking for like, what is the next thing to jump onto, you know? So we've been doing this party party thing for a bit. And it wasn't like we're making the most money from it. I mean, party's dead, you know? And so I got this interest in this, okay, let me try this talent management thing for a bit. And then I started trying to push down me. It wasn't really my, I was in Babcock. So we're, we're harnessing this campus community um, at the time. He didn't have a single song on radio, not a single song on TV. But you could bet that every student, that these private university students had five, six um, Korean songs on their phone. So he was this viral sensation. People were sharing his files up and down schools. His songs were everywhere, but not in the We were already doing shows 500k, 600k, 2009, you know. so. I started seeing a bit of progress at the time, yeah. And I started seeing a bit of progress with Amish Project. And I was like, hmm, okay, we can actually try this thing. You know, so myself and Sammy, we packaged ourselves again. There was this club that time, Rehab. Rehab was probably the first big Lagos club that had some level of association and access to the youth our demography at the time at least most of the clubs before rehab the movidas the 1145s cannot walk in there with your uncles just don't bother you know so rehab was the first that had like a bit of an appeal to the young guys although it was still mad tough to get in so i remember we walked up to Lulu back then myself and sam i think sam even did the pitch i told him you know we had this gilly Google website you know we're trying to document events memories blah 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 and we try to package them myself We'll be taking pictures at rehab and we're uploading them on the website and promoting to um, a campus audience. Right. Obviously, they're losing some young guys from nowhere. Just like our energy and they agree for us. So that's how we started having hands inside rehab. So I'll go to rehab then, carry this big 5D camera on my neck. I still have one picture of <laughs> my camera on my neck. I'll be taking random pictures inside rehab just to get shots, we go and edit it on our laptop, put Giri Guru watermark on it and just post it, you know. And from there, it was interesting because we had access to rehab as university kids. Not a lot of university students had access to rehab. So most of our friends in uni wanted to be close to us and wanted to follow us to Lagos so that they could get into rehab without stress, right? And then rehab was loving us because they were seeing these young university, nice looking, fresh kids, not the regular Lagos Nigeria crowd, you know. But they knew that it wasn't their crowd. They knew it was, this was Giri Group and his guys. So Lolo and the rehab guys kind of gave us a some sort of a promoter spot. We were not even promoters at the time because they had Famo. Famo was like the, one of the big promoters. I think Banker had gotten in at the time. I was plugging them most of the artists through storm records at the time. So we were just bringing university students that were clean enough to get into rehab, really. And then because we had started managing the at the time, Lulu would always encourage us with drinks, free bottles, complimentary drinks, getting that new song on rotation. Rehab at the time, the DJs are playing your song in rehab and you blow inside rehab, kind of almost have blown in Lagos. Maybe not in Ninja, but at least. The Lagos nightlife scene. If, if your song is on spin in rehab, you're gone. Because album launches were happening in rehab. Suski's album launches in rehab. NSC Artistry was in rehab. So see, like a bunch of things were done in rehab at the time. So rehab kind of gave us another level up into like the industry. And then that's how I started getting access to the likes of the Suski, the Prince, you know, the video at the time. You know, and I started building these relationships go for their video shoot, take them the same content, post it on our blog, you know, and then literally just all naturally started from there, you know, and 
we took on Dami's management for like two or three years. Pushed Dami aggressively, intensively, you no know, no label, no financing. We're just guerrilla marketing, doing our thing. And after a while, his gospel caught on to the mainstream. And there was a time where we had like four or five label contracts reviewing on Dami and it was probably my first time even seeing legal contracts at the time. I was like, damn, too. At least our work now has some level of people are seeing, investors are trying to come in. I'm like, okay, there's something here. So I think that's where my talent management passion was really, really born. After seeing the results of what we could do with Dami happen, I mean, it was over a period of time, but with no resource, you know. And even back in school at the time, you would have there were emerging upcoming artists and producers out of nowhere in the Idami Blue. Like, it was like everybody was waiting for somebody to give them the confidence to say that they had an artistic side on campus, right? So you see random producers, artists now come and meeting them and guys on campus, how more, how far? I have these music people, it was shit guys though, it was dope guys though. Everybody just wanted to get on this thing, you know? And after a while, we pushed Damage for a period. Dami got a deal with Hypertech. He got signed to um, Two Face and Love. And I guess my journey kind of just naturally kicked up from there. Um, I remember I met Vector through, not through Dami, but based off of Dami. So Vector had blown at the time, mainstream rapper. He had a major record deal, he was doing his radio and TV. But it was hearing about this kid, like, who is this buzzing kid? You know, it's like sometime when we just started hearing about this Oxley guy who's present in the corner, like who is this guy? You know, that kind of thing. And then Vector was like, he wanted this damn Ukrainian guy to give him a hook because he likes his his voice at the time. So maybe we got the word. I think I can't remember who told us. I sure I got the information. I told them I said no more. But I'm going straight to meet Vector because this is one of for me. Like Vector is already blown. Out of the blue, Vector reached out to me again. And at this time I was already feeling very sulky. If that makes any sense. After investing all my time in Dami. You know, no contract obviously, no big Not yet. Not yet. We're still in school. I mean, I'm driving out of Babcock, picking Dami from Udimas, going to Lagos. The same thing on our way back. You know, so he lived in my house, first disowned him at a point because like, why are you quitting school for music? So he couldn't go home. He was with my family. And then three years after he signed this deal. And then obviously label wants you to have management that's got a bit more experience. I mean, now that I'm sitting here, I can see everything with a lot, a lot less emotion, right? Um, after that happened, obviously, I felt a bit somehow that look at this kid that I invested all of my time in, you know, you can't even fight for me. That's what I was, because now I was saying, ah, okay, even if they want somebody who's got a lot more experience, you know, you should be able to fight and say, this is your guy, you know, so, I mean, he was caught up between fighting for his guy that his investors probably didn't necessarily see value in and, and taking, and taking the actual business deal, you know, so. Obviously, guys are emotional at this time. Sad, sulking, angry. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, this one has just really slide me now, man. How far? You know, so me and Vector connect like almost immediately after we get our first conversation in. We start talking and we start working right after. Now I'm still in uni. But Vector understands that I'm in school and I'm coming out. I'm doing what I can from school. Pushing his music on campus, also giving me a new market that he didn't already have. Brought him into Babcock to do a show, sold out the show, built him a whole new audience, and then we started from there. You know, fast forward, Vector started having a bit of complications with his label. And at the time, I was also this very young, passionate, and driven talent manager that was seeing this artist that was sick with this label that had this much resources, but not much was going on. And then I took the side of the story that I, I had been given by a disgruntled vector at the time. And I ran with it, literally not necessarily trying to hear the label side or even trying to get a mediation conversation or any of those things. I just carried my artist is not happy on my head and I fired the label back to back, you know, and then obviously with that energy, things didn't necessarily get better. They went from bad to worse, you know, 
doctor wasn't happy i was swirling the labor obviously was resisting so there was just tension here and there built up so bad labor ended up slamming vector with an injunction so there's this one whole year where vector cannot release music he can't perform shows he can't do nothing literally clamped his whole income stream now i'm his manager meant to be earning a fee off of that income stream and i've left my previous artists for this bigger artist who are now stuck one year zero bread you know so we're trying to hustle out of this situation Vector is still recording as a stubborn guy that he is. When they are getting to the studio, they are done this jam. And I'm like, damn, this song slaps. Like, what's going on with this jam? But we can't record it. And on the song, he had done this trick punchline with the name Jimmy Jazz. He had done this spin, like Jimmy Jazz kind of punchline. It was hard. And I was like, ah, oh, man, maybe you should find a DJ to give this song to since you can't naturally release. If we put it out as a DJ featuring Vector, and then we started deliberating what DJs can we use, blah, blah, blah. and then obviously naturally off of the punchline, we narrowed down to Jimmy Jack. And I'm like, listen, I don't know Jimmy Jack. Vector had a relationship with him based off of Obala in the their history. So Vector reached out and said, boss, I've got this record, or oh, I did a chicken line with your name on it, blah, 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 blah. And Jimmy's like, send it over. Jimmy hears the song and he's like, fuck, this shit is fire. And immediately after Veto telling me he wanted to release it, I bet you that, ah, oh, well, like, you know my position, if you're going to be able to release it, obviously, knowing that Jimmy is one of the few people in the industry that nobody can bully him. So if Jimmy puts out a record, he's put out a record, kind of thing, you know. So, Michelle went almost crying to Jimmy, like, oh, more, you kind of have to put out this record. And Jimmy's like, okay, you know what? I'll put out this record. So we dropped the record. We we're hustling for us to shoot video. Jimmy Jazz is like, come on, you guys came to drop the song on me. You are not going to drop the cost of the video on me too. Like, you know, so that slowed the conversation down for a bit. Obviously, he wasn't, Vector wasn't earning. Jimmy was like, I've already put out this record. Like, let's meet each other halfway, you know? So the record stalled. We dropped it, but we couldn't push so hard because of resources that the song died. After a while, I'm like, come on, there's still nothing going on with Jimmy and the Vector. Let's see what we can do. So I go back to Jimmy, I'm like, this song, can we shoot the video? Jimmy, like, this song is so old, like, I'm over it now. You guys forced me to drop the song, now I left me the song. I'm like, okay, you know what, can we do, maybe do a remix. I get a couple of more fresh verses and we'll revive the song. And Jimmy's looking at me like, what kind of stubborn child are you? Like, I said, I'm not doing, I'm like, no, like, I push him, push him. And Jimmy's like, okay, you know what, from this junction, you go sort out the remixes. When you sort out the remix and you have all the verses together, come back to me and we'll talk again. So I ran, I took the remixes, I sent it to everybody that I could, obviously. Some declined, naturally, because Vector was going through it. So not a lot of people wanted to necessarily stick their hand in it just because it's better to play safe, right? So a few people did the remix. I think K-Switch and somebody else jumped on the remix at the time. So I came back to Jimmy and I'm like, there you have the remix. And he was like, oh, this boy is so damn restless. Okay, so what are we going to do now? I'm like, okay, Vettel has this video director friend that's ready to shoot for him at zero. Like, it might not be the class, it has quality, but it's, we'll get some visuals on this thing and put it out. And Jimmy was like, okay, I mean, that's you guys covering the video, so that makes sense. Let's see. You know, so I called the guy XYZ. The next one is like, okay, he will shoot us a solid, blah, blah, blah. We get this video done, shot, organize everything. Jimmy's like, come on, you're going to be the one to sort out everything. Don't give me any responsibilities. Fast forward to when the video is ready. This guy sends final edits. You know, we still had one or two corrections. Jimmy's like, okay, you know what? Rather than sending changes back and forth, let's pick a day, go and sit down with the director, sit with the rushes, do one edit sweep, and then leave him to send us a final cut. So we agreed. I was living on the mainland at the time. So Jimmy came and we all met him. He killed her, you know. And then getting to the studio, the guy had finished editing and everything. By the time we we're heading back, me, I'm looking at Jimmy like, in my head, I'm thinking, damn, this would be a nice level up for me, Sha, Jimmy Jack Management. But obviously, in my head, I'm also thinking, what am I going to say to someone like Jimmy who's been relevant for so long? Like, Literally, what am I going to say to pitch myself as his manager, you know? 
So we're there sitting down. Jimmy was just random, so random. He was just saying, man, he likes my energy. He likes the way I carry this virtuous project on my head, regardless of all his legal issues. I didn't let that bite me that he needs someone with that kind of drive on his team. Like he's got literally the resources. He just needs someone that's ready to get up and go all the time, you know. And I just quickly dropped it in there like, Omo, I don't know how much of errands you ought to be sending this guy, but ah, me and my baby shall look it. And Jimmy was like, you, uh, you've got things on your hand now, but I mean, I like your energy, but are you really, really open to it? I'm like, what do you mean are you really open to it? Like, I, do you really have an opening? How about that? And he was like, yeah, like, I'm serious. When are you looking to start? I'm like, when do you want me to start? And he's like, come on, the road is open now. Are you ready? I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay, where do you stay? I said, I'm telling you. He said, okay, you know what? You're going to follow me to the office in Lepi first, and then you'll come back home. And that's how me and it was on the drive from Omole to Lepi. Me and Jimmy had a final conversation. I was like, okay, you're a smart kid. I like the way your mind works. You're going to work with me. You know, and when Jimmy agreed to make me his manager, even I wasn't sure of myself because. At the time, his career was probably older than me. And I'm like, other than being creative and being proactive, I don't necessarily see what I can do for this guy in terms of like bringing in deals and bags. I mean, I'm still working my way up the ladder, you know. And he sat down with me one day and he said to me, obviously, you know that I've had the celebrity managers of the game come and approach me, right? And I'm like, of course. And he's like, I know I have a profile. I know I have what to offer. I don't need somebody who's just going to make, put my name on his roster and make his company look cool with the name Jimmy Jazz and just be using it for whatever bread deals he can get. I need somebody who will take this thing a bit more. And I'm like, okay. I don't have all those hands, though, but if you need someone that will carry it on his head, me, I can carry it on my head. I know that guy. Yeah, let's go. You know, so our first project then was his 25th anniversary celebration. I think that was the second year so I started working with him. Yeah, I just clocked 25 years in the game and wanted to make it into a thing. So we, we did a we wrote a book. We did a black tie gala a dinner for him. We did an album, the industry album, it's like 25 tracks. And then we did a nationwide tour. You know, so I think that was my first time of really showing Jimmy or proving myself or getting the chance to even coordinate or organize anything to see what I could do. You know, so the album, all the verses, I counted everything, you know, the venue for the black tie sponsors, planning the tour, we did all of that. And so Jimmy got really, really comfortable so quickly. And I think from when I started managing Jimmy Jai, I think it took like two years or three years for even the industry to believe that I was his manager. For a long time, people were referring to me as Jimmy just PA because the word manager just didn't sit well with their perception. You know, Jimmy's up here, you're here, like, at best you're a PA, you know, and bless Jimmy, so many conversations, particularly even business meetings, we'll walk in and they'll say, ah, Jimmy, a PA, and Jimmy, he will not ignore it, because you could easily just ignore it and just move on, and Jimmy will say, no, that's actually not my PA, my PA is downstairs, this is my business manager, and he'll tell me, come sit down here, and everybody will be like, really? And he'll be like, yeah. And so he gave me that confidence even when I didn't know I had it. Probably, I'm trying to put a timestamp so I'm a bit more precise. This is probably like, I was going on maybe 22, there about. And Jimmy invested in me, invested in me as much as I invested in him in terms of just like believing in me and even telling me when other people were trying to come and coach me out of his management. You know, and he would tell me, listen, like, you need to sit up, like, this is what's going on, blah, 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 you know. On my graduation day, Jimmy, mean, that's what he did. He came to my university for my graduation. So that's something that he, like, he really took me seriously. And he took his time to put me in certain places, introduced me to a lot of people that till today are still very, very active and relevant in my, in my life. And it helped me position myself with a lot of, like, I would say industry leaders, like the or guys and the execs of the game, like the owners of the radio stations and the TV stations. I've managed Jimmy Jazz for eight years plus now, and yeah, still. And I feel like that has been the most, probably the most productive client that I've, I've worked with personally. 
financial and maybe not also financially because I feel like with him I've gained a lot of more like credibility and access just from being seen as the Jazz manager there's a le- level of respect that comes with it you know I've also been able to gain a solid relationship with DJs nationwide just because they look at you as the manager of the guy who made life happen for them like we can only be DJs because of that broke this spell and you manage him so boss you know so that kind of like and i mean imagine eight years of that level of access walking into the room with like government people you know going into meetings with firs going into meetings with ceos of brands going into meetings with like skipping protocol obviously because who he is you're going from straight to the top you know so over the years i've built a lot of relationships that i probably wouldn't have been able to build so quickly by myself you know, and that really helped. And in the process of managing Jimmy Jack, you know, I worked with EME as well, I managed Shady's project for about a year and a half. And then I left with Shady. And so for me, I feel like Shady was Shady was a was a bit of a it was a bit of a tough one because where I was coming from. I was coming from a journey where I had been investing in talents, my time, my money, my everything, the money that I didn't even have, you know, and I got into working with Shady. EME had this long roster of obviously these skills, Banky was on the roster, Niola was on the roster. Obviously, Wiz was doing so well. Skills was trying, pretty much trying to keep up. And they really, I think in hindsight, thinking about it as well, they really wanted to see, I guess, each artist do their own thing and not necessarily wait for the label to do everything because the label was doing a lot of the time, you know. And then obviously the label head, Banky himself, still had his own career, right? So I think the goal of the time was to try and get as much momentum off Shady by himself so that the label could then see that this boy is onto something, you know. The guy was sick. His vocals were incredible, but... We just pushing him was hard, you know. So he had a couple of singles on the air that were doing really well, Opoju and a couple of songs, but he just wasn't there, you know. So after a while, we put together this album. Um, what was it called? Rhythm and Soul, I think. It was with Shady's album, and we aired this album really well. We had Whiskey on the album, had Two Face on the album, had Banky on the album, had a bunch of people on the album, really done well and Shady put out the album and kind of like really helped change his life. His career started picking up. We were able to secure him an endorsement with Metro Taxi at the time. Um, started doing stuff. He did this theme song commercial for Airtel, you know, so he had started like getting into corporate conversations and all of that. But at the time, I'm not sure what the label's vision was, but I think with the whole I guess post whiskey drama, the label like kind of lost their natural flair and interest in investing and dying for an audience. If that kind of made sense, so you could tell in how willing they were for the other artists. So it was just like okay, we'll do what we can. Like nobody's gonna go and die and break their backs, you know. And so for me at the time it was stressful because I wasn't getting a lot of funds from the label for their own reasons. I was spending my time, my resources. I was moving Shady around in my car. Literally, Shady had an interview. I had to shut down my day because I had to take my car, pick him up, go there, come back. You know, so after a while, it wasn't necessarily the most productive for me, myself. And we had this conversation where Shady was trying to leave the label because he was trying to find something for himself as well. But thankfully so, that didn't become a mess because I, I feel like I also was able to use my, a little bit of my experience from the Vector YSG situation to help Shady navigate through the EME exit a bit more naturally and peacefully. And bless Banky, Banky signed him off, told him he can go, you know, and they let him go. And at the time he left EME, we tried to sign him to another label or at least an investor. And for me, that's really, at that time, that's what I wanted to do for him, getting to a place where he was at least comfortable enough to sustain himself before I pulled back. Because at that point, I was already getting drained, 
you know, like there was only so much I could still do by myself, you know. So I took a break from just talent management, the whole road life. It was just draining for me. So I took this break and I was home for like probably not up to a year, but like maybe six months about just absolutely doing nothing, just trying to figure out, okay, what's next? I've done this artist management journey now. I know I can't do it because all the artists I've pushed so far, I didn't have money to push them, but I've seen the progress that I've put in their career. So I know that if the resources are right, this thing can be done, you know? So one random money, I see a call from Banky. Now this is me assuming that because we've left DME and all of that, Banky probably doesn't care so much anymore about me, you know, just his artist manager, right? Um, but I mean, flashback, childhood fountain. I mean, banking a fountain boy. You know, my, me and his younger brothers, Timmy and Fumi, are still relatively close. The same church, in Fountain of Life Church, Lipe Drew, um, was a hot spot, man. It was where literally everybody went to. I mean, I guess even in the terms of like art and entertainment, if you think about it, a lot of the interest kind of also started there. Because if you remember, there were a lot of like celebrities at the time coming to church. Yeah. Jimmy Odukoya, yeah, I mean, TZ, DRB, literally. Um, but Budge wasn't a fountain kid, but like, yeah, yeah, Green Springs, yeah, all Green Springs kids were in boarding house. They were coming to fountain on Sundays, guaranteed. Literally, all the schools, Grange, it was a mix of literally almost everyone, you know, and then celebrities then, like them, Onyo Kawenu, them Zakiadze, them, the big actors of the time, when we were kids, you know, were coming to the church. And so it was like a, it was a nice place to be, you know. It was a nice place with different kinds of people with really, really good hearts and intentions, you know. So, obviously, we had connected with Banky childhood days, obviously. He didn't remember. My whole time working with Banky, I shared his manager. I never went to meet him to say, do you remember me from Fountain? Because, I mean, I don't know how to do all those kind of... If you remember, you remember me, you know. And But his younger brothers, Temi and Fumi, because we were actually friends, Banky is not my mate. So, I mean, I'm not sure how much you remember me from childhood, right? But me and Timmy, they used to run around together. So, every time Timmy comes to Lagos and he stays in Banky's house, he ends up coming out and I'm the one that ends up probably taking them out. So, after a while, Timmy, they were telling Banky that, ah, don't you remember this guy from Fountain? That like, this guy used to come for house fellowship back in the day, you know? So, I think, obviously, Banky grew this, I don't know, probably grew this extra likeness towards me after that. You know, so one day randomly, I was just in my house and my phone rang and I picked up the call and it was Banky. And he was like, yo, what are you up to these days? Like, what are you up to now? And I'm like, at the moment, absolutely nothing. And he's like, are you open to getting on a job? I'm like, what do you mean job? Like office job nine to five. He was like, yeah, like it's a music and entertainment opportunity though, but it's a white color job. And I'm like, okay, I mean, I'll be dumb to say no. I've got nothing on my hands at the moment. Let's have the conversation and see. I was quick to ask Banky, do you have any idea what the salary range is? Because at this point, me, I'm looking to balance up my cash. You know, and Banky gave me what he thought the range was, but he was like, listen, in all fairness, don't go in there with this in mind. Go and negotiate what you think is fair for you and do what you can, you know. So Banky asked for my resume, my email address, and I sent him everything. And in less than 20 minutes, Banky had done this email introduction between me and the owner of one of these big radio stations, who apparently was one of the directors of the company I was to work for as well. And when I saw this email, I literally dropped my phone. Like, I, my phone fell from my hands because... The way Banky had done this introduction, he had introduced me like, imagine, you see someone like, someone like maybe, hmm, I'll say maybe someone like Bankuli, who's got like cred in the game, yeah? Imagine Banky doing an email intro of me back then with that kind of, with that kind of packaging, like this guy is this, He's worked with, he manages Jimmy Jads, he's professional in his game, he's done this, 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 this. And when I saw this email, I was cold. I was like, damn, I didn't even know Banky felt this way about me. Like, apparently, this nigga had been watching me do my thing from a distance and just ticking his boxes, like, okay, this guy can do his thing. 
you know, so when I saw the email, I was cold, and then Mr. Chris Obosi at the time, and Mr. Chris called me, I was like, my old guy, good morning, I was, I was like, huh, who is your guy, please, sir, like, immediately, I was like, sir, please, like, please, and he was like, come to my office, back you give this nice introduction, let's talk, and then I went to BTFM to meet Mr. Chris, and I got into his office, and there was a lady sitting right next to the table, chair where I was, and I, as I walked in, he just said to me, meet Rosalind, Rosalind meet my girl, this is your CEO, this is your new head of music and entertainment, and literally that was it. The CEO of the company that he wanted me to work for was sitting right there, MTech, and he was like, this is your new head of music, and this is your CEO. We had not had any conversation, we had not discussed the role, we had not negotiated price, we just based off of credibility, right? So after that, I was like, okay, two of you sit down and discuss what your terms are. So he was sitting right there, starting negotiating price. And he asked me about what I do. So I told him my journey, blah, blah, blah. And he made me an offer. And I'm like, this seems like a distant offer. However, I have way too many things I'm doing at the moment. If I'm going to shut all these things down, it's going to face your company. I want more. And Mr. Chris laughed and laughed and was like, dude, you can't get more. Like, you're not the CEO of the company. Humble yourself, kind of, you know? So I'm like, all right, cool. I'll wait to hear if it was off and now, and we'll see how it goes. So I left the office. I told Banky I'd done the meeting. Um, but I'm waiting to hear from, I'm waiting to hear from them on what their offer would be to see if I'll proceed with the conversation. And they called me in for an interview. And I remember I had two interviews that day. And I think I was meant to, do an interview for Chivas as well. Myself and Deku now blew to that Chivas interview. They both flogged me at the booth. So when I entered her interview, I just knew this Chivas girl was not for me. So I just went back to her and did my interview. It was very short. And then my job offer came and they offered me more than I negotiated in the meeting. You see the figure that I dropped that Mr. Chris said, are you okay? Are you the CEO of the company? My job offer came with more than that figure. So when the job offer came, I was like, Okay, at this point, what is your excuse for not taking this job? Like, you actually over-negotiated, hoping to scare them off, and they came back with even more. more. So I, I said, okay, you know what? Let me give this thing a try. And that's how I got off the streets from road manager, trying to figure it out on my own to get into, like, a corporate structure, you know? And MTech at the time, for context, was doing um, music monetization, but locally from coloring back to vast services and stuff like that. So that was my first time of seeing the real music numbers, seeing actual numbers. So forget who is blowing on the streets and who is driving the Camaro, or who is driving the Lexus. How much are they actually making? Right? That was my first time of actually really seeing numbers. You know, so I started paying attention. And interestingly, my role was I was managing portfolio across Africa. I was the head of the department for the whole of Africa. So I was dealing with 12 different countries at the same time for my desk. So I've seen real-time reports, logs of music sales across Africa, comparing territory for territory, artist for artist, which Nigerian artist is popping in East Africa. There was real-time data that I could see. Now, the vast industry at the time kind of had its own hiccups because of how it ended, the regulations and all of that stuff. You know, so MTech started, revenue from vast at the time was ridiculous. So probably making like, I don't know, I'm not gonna, but we're making, sometimes we're making like over a hundred million a month per network. The game had been shut down. They put a lot of regulations. So now MTech was looking to see what other new ideas they could do with all the resources they had within the music industry that would not be limited to the vast industry. That's how my employment actually apparently came about. They needed new minds, new heads in the game that could think differently. So I came in, management meeting, youngest person in the room. I was sitting in management meeting, father of six, probably half snoring. You know, it was it was an interesting mix, but it wasn't also my natural space because I was working with a lot of older people. It felt like I was in a government office, kind of, right? So at the time, we're looking at this whole, MTech has this licenses to a lot of music, you know, just by CRBTs. I'm like, okay, we already have these rights. Why don't we create our own music streaming service? We already own the rights to the music. Rather than give the telcos to monetize and then they'll give us a fraction that will not still share with the artists. If we make one naira, 
we can give the artist a bigger revenue share because we're owning, we're controlling the one now. So that's how that conversation started. So we had two platforms that we were trying to build under my department as the future of MTech, right? One was called Sound Tribe, that was a music platform. And then the other was called Show Africa. So Show Africa was live streaming. And this was how many years ago? 2015, there about. We created this live streaming platform. This was before COVID. So live streaming wasn't even a thing. But we're like, let's create this live streaming platform where we can watch events from wherever they are, you know, without having to go out of their houses. The market wasn't ready for it, but we had the idea and we had built the technology. And I had this, we had this partnership with Trace. I spoke to Lan Ray and we had this partnership with Trace. So Trace Live, we started live streaming Trace Live, every Trace Live were live streaming and then the, the service started going out there. So obviously the company kind of started having a bit of faith in me after they seen the Trace partnership and everything that started going on. So they started pumping a bit of interest in the music streaming product that wasn't off the ground yet. So we had the music, we had done the demo app and blah, blah, blah. Fast forward, one of my our directors had this conversation with um, the team at Warner Music. I think Warner was trying to come into Nigeria at the time. And Warner, their intention was not to come and set up shop. They were trying to come and invest in already existing entities. So MTech was one of the shortlisted entities when we took a break. So Warner came into Nigeria at the time. I think they were the last of the top three to come in. Sony had come in, Universal had come in. And I think one at the time was trying to go a different route, which was to invest in already existing entities rather than coming to sign individuals, right? So they were shopping for companies that had done maybe at least 10 years in the game with credible numbers, credible, just some level of credibility. And then the one system would back them and invest in them and then you know, so MTech was one of the companies that shortly set for that partnership. So my director had brought the Warner team in to MTech for um, a presentation of our quote unquote the future of MTech because that's what Warner wanted to see. Now, at the time, MTech was so dependent on this vast industry that the platforms that we were creating under the music and entertainment department were kind of like the newest services under MTech. We had the digital marketing department creating some digital marketing solutions, but the services under my department is what one I really wanted to see. So they had this roundtable meeting, I brought out my platform, did this presentation to the Warner team. At the time, I think Alfonso came in and somebody else came in. But I'd done the pitch, they had loved the idea. They were saying, okay, you know what? Let's have a f- several more conversations and then we'll close this deal. So now they put me in direct contact with the vice president just to be sharing the files of the app and stuff like that. I sent them the first version. They checked the app. They wanted an iOS version because we sent them an Android version. They wanted an iOS version. And then MTech, we kind of like had some technical delays shot delivering the iOS version in time. So Wanna kind of moved. I think they had like a time crunch. So they kind of moved on to another partnership. Now, I don't, I think this was going on my second year at MTech. And the industry, like I said, was coming down before I got in. So I literally watched it crash. So after a while, I was like, okay, what am I doing here? I've created these new two new platforms. We don't have the resources to keep them into market the way we want to. I I'd already started feeling very dragged by being there like the first year i was like okay we'll move and then after a while i was like man now i just feel like i'm resuming to the office coming to this office and just coming to collect my salary you know so i started saying you know what i'm gonna leave i'm gonna leave i told my ceo i was gonna leave she was like yeah you're bluffing i sent him my resignation note she ignored it for like two weeks i was like okay what's going on 